Mr. Wong founded Xerion Software in 2003 and created iForm Builder in 2008. iForm Builder is currently being used in over 125 countries and is the fastest growing mobile data collection solution on the market. iForm Builder was the first data collection app to achieve U.S. HIPAA compliance status on the Apple App Store and was selected as one of the essential iPhone apps for business by Apple. Please join me in welcoming Z Wong. Good morning. Thank you. So, thanks for CRS for uh, giving me this wonderful journey, actually, for the last few years to work together. Thanks, Dr. Wu. Thanks, Carol. Definitely, I've, I've talked about um, Carol. is like a teacher to me. Uh, she always tell me, <laughs> yeah, I won't go into <laughs> Right. Um, so, I was told that um, in a presentation you can only talk about three points. That's only that's uh, how much you remember. I think Barbara said that. Um, anyway, so I want to start with why I came to the U.S. Um, so I grew up in this little town of seven million people called Hong Kong in southern China. Um, so the story starts two years before I graduated from high school. This was a um, typical day at the end of school year, because of summer. I was playing ping pong, and my advisor came looking for me. He found me and um, set me aside and, and looked at me seriously. And he said, Z, I know that you apply for advanced mathematics, um, but do you mind taking biology instead? So the story is, is, is that uh, we, these are electives. So you can choose advanced math or biology or, or some other class just like any, any, uh, any school system. So he's trying to, trying to tell me too many, too many kids apply for advanced math and trying to convince me to go into biology. So I ask, um, what, what, what if I say no? <laughs> and then he paused and he said, um, yeah, you may have to look for a different school next year, if you say no. Yeah. So the thought of having to go home and tell my parents that I, I, I need to look for a new school next year, and I really want to get back to ping pong. <laughs> so I said, okay, fine, I'll, I'll take biology. So I took biology uh, for the next two years, uh, last two years of my high school. And I didn't know at that time, let's see if this will work well, yeah. I didn't know at that time, but that set out a major roadblock in my life. Um, for, in, in our system, um, if you choose one path, you can't go back. I didn't know at the time, I said, uh, I really didn't. Because biology set you in the medical path uh, versus math, advanced math, will take you into engineering math uh, path. Um, so that was the path that was set, and when I was ready to apply for college, I couldn't even apply for any engineering majors, even though I had the grades. So that was that bad. Um, so I told my dad, I, I, I can't stay here. I, um, I love engineering, and, and I can't just stay here. So I learned of this place called the land of the free, um, <laughs> and I'm leaving. So here I am. Um, so why am I telling this story? Um, because I, I just hate to be put into a box. Um, as I grew up, I, I can't stand being put into a box. So as I get older, that translates into not just for me. It, it's not I hate to be put into a box, not just for me. Um, it's for my families too, for my friends, for my teams, for my customers. Everybody around me I hate people being put into boxes or constraint. What that actually translates to as I, as I get older is that I love doing things that bring about people's full potential. And that's what I love to do. And that's exactly what we have built as a company. We have built, um, uh, for about 10 years, we built a company that we create software that makes experts awesome. Now you guys are the experts. We want to make you do what you do good 
better. What you do is great things. You want to create stuff, software. That's what we know how to do. Only thing I know how to do. Um, make you guys do more. Um, so uh, you all probably heard of this product, iPhone Builder. Not going to go into detail. Um, we created this in in 2009, and it's been a wonderful journey. Um, I want to show this slide because of the distribution. So 85%, um, this is for last year's uh, iPhone Builder revenue distribution. 85% of our revenue came from uh, non-NGO sector. And I like to actually call this, everywhere else, um, what we do, what we apply, the product, it's about making the world safer, actually. Right? We inspect buildings in the engineering world. We inspect buildings, bridges, roads, elevators, and in the healthcare world, we inspect um, your operating room. We make sure, work with Ecolab to make sure the place is clean. Um, and then, of course, Gago May, I like to joke about when you, when you have the food that you enjoy on the airlines, we are the ones who make sure they're safe. Right? So all in all, we're, we're um, in the business of making the world safer. But I love, and I told many of you already, I love coming to the NGO world um, and, and, of course, I appreciate the, uh, the foresight that CRS and Carol and the team um, allow us to serve this, this uh, industry. Is that in this NGO industry, we're not just making the world safer, we're making the world better. Um, so, the story continues. Four years ago, I bumped into this thing called the plot computing. Um, not sure, I, I'm actually sure you've never heard of it. Um, nobody has seen it because it's now migrated into called the IoT. Um, uh, a few years ago, it was talk called the plot computing. And I found this thing, and I thought, wouldn't it be great if CRS and other NGO um, would have this technology? They can go beyond where they can be been before. They can go deeper into the village, go deeper into the jungle. Um, so that's what we did. We talked to um, Carol Orr and team, and we developed it. And so today, uh, most CRS project and other, other customers uh, will carry these uh, backpacks from our partners. And inside, there's these, what we call club. It, it's like an Apple TV kind of thing. Um, it creates a local club. So they can, they can take a team deep into the jungle uh, or desert or village, go beyond where technology was before, go further, go count the otherwise un unaccounted people. And, and I found that to be amazing. And, and I always go back to, um, I appreciate the opportunity to um, allow us to do these kind of things. So I want to show a, 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 some numbers um, that I showed uh, uh, two days ago. Uh, this is a raw uh, server log for a, a year. And this is daily record upload across global CRS. And I want to uh, point out two uh, particular dates. Summer of last year, and then just uh, two weeks ago. Two dates. So in summer of last year, CRS had submitted 68,000 records. Now, what are these records? These records are anything from um, a typical survey, um, or checklist, checked in, uh, beneficiary registration, to an entire household survey. It will be one point on you. Um, and on, on, on that day, um, yeah, 68,000. And last, last uh, two weeks ago, 54,000. Now, what I want to point out is, uh, is that even at the low point, we're talking about tens of thousands of, of uh, records of data. Um, so I want to zoom in a little bit. Um, this I haven't seen. Next, it turns out on that very August day of last year, 65 of the 68,000 68, that we saw was from one project. And that's pretty amazing. Um, this one project. So I was like, put it into context. 
let's say they work eight hours that day. It's like they upload 2.28 records per second on that day. Tick tock, two more, right? Isn't that amazing? Um, that's pretty, pretty, pretty uh, mind-boggling. Um, what is even more mind-boggling is that if we zoom all the way out outside of CRS and, and, and including all of our customers, all of our across all sectors, we're now doing almost half a million a day. Now, in the last couple of days, we talked about scalability, we talked about sustainability, and I think we're kind of looking at scale here. So if you would um, just imagine the kind of paperwork that we'll otherwise have to create um, without ICT, that is, that is pretty my model. So I want to, actually, I want to take this opportunity um, to thank my team. Many of my team is here, and this is not done in vacuum. And actually, team, why don't you guys stand up? I want to, I want to give you guys a, a round of applause. <laughs> Um, I, I told a lot of people in the last few days, we're, we're tiny teams. We are, um, at this very point, 22 people um, in three offices. Um, we're, we're very, very tiny. You, many people think we're like 700 people. Um, yeah, we produce kind of 700 people of, of work. We're tiny. <laughs> so this is an amazing team, um, and I thank you for that. So I want to go back a little bit uh, about, I, I talked about the paper, um, but is, is, is saving paper the only thing you want to do? Um, no, so that is my, the second point. So yeah, that was my point number one. This is scale and it kind of work. Um, point number two, actually I wanted to talk about something else. I want to talk about uh, my camera, yeah. So, um, a couple months ago, I took my kids to Legoland. And if you have not been there, um, you should, if you have kids, because uh, they, they go nuts for some reason. They don't go as nut in, um, in uh, Disneyland. I don't know why. They behave kind of OK in Disneyland. But once they get to Legoland, they all like went crazy. Um, there was this um, buffet. It's called a Lego buffet in, in the new hotel. And, and um, yeah, you imagine a thousand rooms. Each room has two, three kids, 3,000 kids in this buffet, like, yeah, half. Um, so on that day, I, I took the kids there. And that one day, I took 500 pictures. Um, and I'm not alone, right? So um, I'm sure many of you are, are parents, and you take their pictures like, yeah, the <laughs> right, you know what I'm talking about. And, um, and I don't just use the camera to just take crazy amount of pictures. I also now use it to basically record everything. Um, I was shopping for a desk. I, I took a picture of, of the price, so I would rem remember which one I looked at. And I go home, I can, I can sort through it. Um, and this next one is my favorite, and, and I'm sure many of you do that. You're just taking a picture of your parking spot, <laughs> right? So I remember I parked at section U. <laughs> so why, why am I talking about this? Um, because none of these, none of the above, are considered traditional photography, right? These are not traditional photography. And yet we do this every day now. Um, and, and we didn't start here. We didn't just jump into this, like, taking pictures like crazy all of a sudden. We actually start here. I remember a few years ago, when you, when you all get your first uh, digital camera, you would, you would then go to CVS or, or uh, Walmart, and you would print them out. Because we came from a world where, where we develop pictures, right? We used to take the film, the roll, to CVS or, or the other place that you develop them, right? So that, that was like a typical um, technology transfer. You're replacing something. So my point being, had we continued to just print out pictures, we will never get here. We will never get to the point that you, could do, you just have basically complete recollection of everything you see 
um, around you. And we're now using camera very differently than before. So how do we get, get here? And, and um, Charles has touched on that. Um, and of course, that requires behavior change. So how do we do that? Well, I can't. I, I don't have the answer. If I have the answer, I'll be teaching in school. Um, and actually, I bump into a um, teacher <laughs> that, um, yeah, Mark Bell. Um, Dr. Bell he had to talk about this very thing yesterday. And so that will be my, my commercial of why people should come to ICT 40 because I learned so much. Everything I want to talk about has been talked about in the last two days. Um, so, um, so I told him I, I'm going to like mention him and Mara, you around. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so he talked about if you miss his call, uh, talk, you can, I guess, go back online with uh, uh, CRS, always have it available. So we talked about a lot of points um, of how to drive behavior change. One of the key points that I want to point out is, um, it, it is um, about marketing. Um, driving behavior change inside an organization is very similar to how you market a product to your consumers. Um, and I want to add one more thing um, to Dr. Bell's uh, presentation. And maybe we can collaborate on that. And, and actually, that is how we also encourage other customers to drive behavior change, because it's not unique uh, to the development sector. Every sector is going through this when they implement technology. And, um, and that is allow your champions to drive for you. Uh, you know these people. These are the people who sign up for Netflix first uh, before anybody. These are the people who buy the latest uh, gadgets, right? Uh, whoever has the Apple Watch right now are those people. I don't have one yet. Um, and you can identify these people in your organization or outside of, of your organization. And if you would empower them, they will help you drive behavior change in your particular um, vertical or the problems you're, you're trying to solve. And so that is my second point. I'm doing very good on time. So my third point, um, again, it goes back to something I want to talk about, completely irrelevant. Um, and oh, did I mention these points are not related? Actually, they're, they're just random. Um, and another commercial of why people should come to ICT40, this point that didn't exist two, two days ago. Um, I just learned. So, a year ago, I took my kid to this uh, science fair, uh, DC science fair. Uh, it, it's gigantic. And that only happens once every two years. And they only have two days. So the problem is, even if you spend the first minute to the last minute, you can't walk through the whole thing. So I, I don't understand why they only do this uh, for two days. But I told my son there, and um, my 10-year-old saw the 3D, compute, uh, 3D printer for the first time. And oh, I jumped in. Um, <laughs> 3D printer for the first time. And he came home like, Dad, I need it. I need it. I want it. I want it. And I said, no, no, no. I, I, we're not buying a 3D printer. Uh, it's too expensive. Um, it's too expensive. But if you can make money from it, maybe I can finance you. <laughs> so you kind of know where I'm leading it to. So for the next two months, um, instead of bedtime story, we did bedtime business planning. <laughs> um, so we looked at how, how much are the printers, how much are the, the material that you need, how much they cost, what can he print, would there be a market? We look at competitors. Um, we look at what they charge. Um, and amazing things happen. Um, I, and yeah, buy me a beer, I'll tell you all the details. Um, amazing things happen. Originally, he was looking at a $4,000 printer. And, and as we walk through, as I say, well, I'll, I'll finance you the money, you will pay me back. Um, and he was working through the, the math. And he realized that he cannot do enough business 
to afford that $4,000 printer. Um, and so he went out and found a $500 printer. And when, if the parents out there, when was the last time that your kid asked for a cheaper toy? <laughs> right? So this drive that. Um, and, and so we did. Uh, we, we got this. Um, this is a $500 printer. It's massive. It's like an old. Um, so he, he started executing the business plan. So now he, a 10-year-old, uh, has a 3D printing business. So these are the things that he prints, uh, keychains, uh, name tags. He will go around the neighborhood, sell them, and he will sell them to all my friends. <laughs> here, here, right? Anywhere we go, he will sell. And, um, and he loved it, and I loved it too. Um, this happens last month, we went out to Silicon Valley. Uh, this is a uh, maker fair where all the 3D printing happens. And he has a booth, selling, happy. Um, and this is his project. <laughs> <laughs> right. So why am I talking about this uh, other than just being a very proud uh, father? Um, because in the last two days, I was like, well, why am I only doing this for my son? I should be doing this for all the sons and daughters out there. And guess what? There is a project. <laughs> Not a commercial why you should come to ICT40. Um, that um, from, from the University of Purdue, they are doing that. Um, so I would love to collaborate. So that's what, that will be what I, what I want to point out. And what's more is that last night we gave a, a, a challenge award to a team from the University of Notre Dame. And they created a IoT solution that monitor vaccine temperatures using very cheap uh, sensors and then feed data back into iPhone Beard. Um, and so here's the thought. What if we continue to work with this team? What if we continue to create and design a ruptedized sensor, a remote sensor, not just temperature, but other sensors. Um, kids from university can design that, uh, from sensors to the case, ruptedized case, and we created a blueprint for creating these sensors. Then we work with other teams to send them out to third world countries and fund enterprise so that young people can can make these. Now, these are cheap, so they can. They can order from China and maybe print the case. They can put it together, and then we'll buy from them, right? So that's the kind of impact I think we can all do um, by thinking together. So to me, I, I've been talking about this. Everything is kind of like a business. Um, and if we do that, now we'll create local businesses that they, they know about sensing, and um, they can create that. They can make money. I can make money because I can buy from them. Um, and we'll, we all do good while uh, making money. So to me, um, NGO doesn't have to be, uh, just don't never think about money. <laughs> anyway, so that's my third point. Uh, and here's my, um, all my unrelated random thoughts. Um, we have a solution that is scalable and sustainable. And if you want to drive behavior change, you kind of, need champions. And, um, and lastly, I would love to be part of empowering youth uh, so that they start their own business and they, they, they get out of poverty on their own. Right, so, um, yeah, three points, right? So always one last thing. Um, so uh, what I want to go into next um, is that uh, where are we going from here? We lived in a very amazing time right now. Um, and in the last two days, we've talked about um, a lot of uh, disruption yesterday, talked about Uber, and, and we heard from Charles about big data. And this data thing fascinates me. Um, so for, for the long, longest time, I've, I've said, well, that's all we do. We will stay with mobile data collection. We, we won't cross that because I believe we should always do just what we do best. Um, but over the last um, few years, I was like, well, maybe there's something there. Um, 
and and I and I told our customers, uh, including CRS, look for some other reporting BI solutions. There are many, many out there, right? Pump data to Esri, um, they can solve the problem, right? On on GIS, yes, um, but on anything else, there, our customers are still having trouble. Um, so in the next couple years, we're going to go into uh, these things. Well, naturally, you, you are in the business of collecting data, you have a lot of them. And so we kind of want to deal with that. And that's what we're going to go, uh, going into data storage, data sharing, and data analytics. And to me, data analytics is it's a very scary thing uh, to touch on because I've been telling people I won't touch that. Um, and now, I'm doing very good on time, so I'll, 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 I'll finish early, um, and we'll have coffee early. So uh, we're going to launch a brand new product later on this year, and we have a session um, uh, in, in just a minute to, to go through it. And so I'm not going to go through detail here. But to do data storage, data sharing, and data analytics, we're looking at it in a slightly different way, and looking at it uh, fast forward. So I'd love to... Uh, project a world where it's going to be and then position us at the right place and on data storage in particular we learned this concept called trust no one uh, architecture and the idea is that you will build a infrastructure that you don't you don't trust the vendor don't trust us the vendor um, and the idea is that no one even inside a vendor can see your data and this is not our invention by any means it's just a new way of thinking uh, in our industry. And so we're going to incorporate that. The, uh, the basic idea is that we won't have the key uh, to decrypt your data. You, the end, end customer, is the only one. So you don't have to trust us. You don't have to trust um, Amazon or Rackspace, whoever is hosting the machine. You don't have to trust the, the Cisco. You, don't, well, you may have to trust uh, our government. <laughs> I have one. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> There, there is still a debate, so I, yeah, so I won't go into detail. But the idea is that um, I believe our industry will go through a massive change in terms of security. Uh, because right now, we're largely built on the firewall concept. So you have a great firewall. Inside it, everything is open. Outside, is is, is uh, dangerous. So you, you, you trust your firewall. And if you, if you look at the Sony bridge, that's exactly the problem. Because inside a firewall, everything is open. So once you break through that, yeah, uh, the, the entire company's data is, is yours. Uh, so this trust no one concept uh, builds on that you only will share what you share, and the keys are all dynamically created, so you don't have to um, expose too much, even if there is a comp. And, and that leads us to data sharing. We talked about sharing a lot, um, um, and open data yesterday, we also talked about sharing. I remember there was a question about, well, if I share everything, uh, what was my value? Um, and again, I like to take it from a different angle. Um, rather than pushing for open data, which is all great, so I, I always, um, I have kids, right? So um, as I observe the kids uh, learning the term share, it, it, between age three to four, they start to learn to share. And at that time, share actually mean give it to me. Um, <laughs> like if, you, if you go to a kindergarten, if you go to a kindergarten and, and observe how they behave, share basically means give it to me. Share, right? Um, now, to me, open data uh, are the good kids. Like we have good kids uh, among us. You will naturally share. There are good kids, right? Um, that's open data. But there are none of us here. But there are there are, there are some other some other people in in, in the industry um, that they say, yeah, I, I, I'll share. But if you share it to me, I'll, I'll yeah. I, I I think Lauren talked about it yesterday. Um, so how do we address that? I I like to attack that problem. Um, and I would love to create something that I give you a lot of control. So you can try. You can say I share with you, and I, I take it back. Maybe, maybe by giving you a lot of control, you will try. You will, you will share a little bit. 
and that may in the long run drive more. I always equate to how, how sharing differ, um, differ between Twitter and Facebook. So Twitter is always open, right? Facebook is by nature semi-private. Um, that, well, in the beginning anyway, you were, you, you were supposed to only uh, share to your friends. So in, in the, in what, what it, turns, it turns into is Twitter, Twitter are for people who just want to talk about stuff, right? And when you're talking among friends, you go to, you go to Facebook. And more people who said they are not going to share will share on Facebook than on Twitter because it's the, it's the mindset of having control. So I would love to try to create something that give you more control. So maybe you, well, not you, those, those bad guys uh, that, that are not into open data will, will try to share a little bit more. Right? And the last thing um, about uh, data analytics um, is this idea that I, I'm still kind of struggling. There are so much data analytics things out there. And yet, every day, our customers still come back and say, hey, if you guys can help us create this report. And I said, no, talk to your reporting team. You, you spend a million dollars, multiple millions of dollars, find those reporting tools, BI teams, um, let them do it. And they always come back. Um, and I think we have kind of cracked the nut of our customers are looking for something not the industry called data analytics, something quite simple. And again, I'm not going to go into detail. So um, that's all, um, three points and where we're going. So we have three sessions um, in, in, in a little bit. So I want to, because there are only two time slots um, and you have to make a choice. So I want to, I want to tell you a little bit of how, how to share your, your time. If you've never heard about iPhone building, um, then you can go to uh, Barrett's um, session about learning what it is, what can it do for you, how it can help you do what you do better, better, um, how it can make you awesome. And for the rest of you, if you want to learn about the, um, the club, where it's the backpack thingy, uh, we're building a new prototype. Um, you can go to a more session in, uh, on the second floor. Uh, if you're crazy, um, if you want to learn what we're up to next, come to my session. So, but only those crazy people. And I want to warn you first, because I spent so much time preparing for this, I, I didn't prepare for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So um, I want to end in this. Um, I, um, I always equate starting a business. It's like being thrown into the middle of the ocean. Um, you don't have, you have to swim. If you don't do that, you will die. But you see no land, so you don't know which direction you swim. But you just have to do it. And as you swim, um, you, will, you will question yourself, am I swimming in the right direction? And the world always tells you that ah, you, that's wrong, that, that wouldn't work. Um, so uh, this journey started m more than 10 years ago. We started swimming, and we did work hard and swim and swim, and, and I felt very, very lucky. Found a team, found nice uh, customers, and we found land. And we, when we climb on the beach, exhausted, start thinking about, okay, well, this is the uh, data collection that we'll be building, and for the last five years, things are getting stabilized, pretty good, we're building huts, we're building small villages in, in the beach, Things are doing well, um, but I, as I look, we're at the beach now, right? As I as I look, there's a mountain ahead of us, um, and there's some smoke behind behind the mountain. I believe that smoke represents the data future. I believe that smoke represents something that is bigger that we can tackle. But there's this mountain ahead of us, um, but. We'll, we'll go there. We'll try to continue to do our best. And again, thank you for, for this opportunity. Um, and the reason um, that um, I always feel like I'm crazy to do what I've been doing um, is that, like I said in the beginning, I love to create stuff that bring out the full potential of everybody. So thank you very much.
So we actually 